for us as a neighbor of Delane, Florida, to an the University of Florida, so he's a proud leader. He's crying a little bit from the College World Series, but we won't go there. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Uh, but then, more importantly, in our OTC, while well, I was at the University of Florida, they came in the Marine Corps, wanted to be a Marine, wanted to lead, wanted to fly. Went to all this flight in up, went down to Pensacola, went to uh, Marine, Mississippi, and then came here for the first of many, many tours and a lot of long and successful stints here at Second Law in, in the Carolina Magic. Uh, most of this time, for those of you here, was dealing with 231 and 542. Uh, great squadrons, been out flying with them. Uh, pilot, instructor, operations, maintenance, you name it, they're putting bullets in the squadron, Russell did it. Now, he distinguished himself on the way up, you know, he had a call sign. Call sign is Bart. Bart, okay? Now, I'm a grunt, but you, you always ask an aviator what's your call sign. And then my own voice starts with a zero, so your mind starts turning there, and you're telling you, how do you get that? Was it for good reasons or bad reasons, or is there a double on time there? I'll come back to that one later, too. Okay. <laughs> anyway, Russell distinguished himself in 231, getting started in the Marine Corps. I won't tell you about a MAG CEO or a Sweden CEO who said they were worried about you from the get-go, because if you're last that came up, you were the last one to get all the checks in the boxes. The fact that you're three or 25 years later means at least your checks stuck. They stayed in the box. <laughs> so, slow beginning, but great finish here. So, a great finish here. Right? Uh, but Russell distinguished himself early on as a pilot. Uh, as you know, back in those days, he wasn't but two, two and a half years in the squadron in Desert Shield, Desert Storm Mountain. And he was off and running. And he did great stuff. 17 combat missions. 17th one was a little scarier than the first 16, thanks to the service of air missile. missile. And, uh, Russell spent a very long 26 days in a place he had not expected to spend time in. And, uh, but repatriated and had Purple Heart, uh, POW, uh, but came back to the Marine Corps with a different degree of experience and a different kind of steely resolve than he had going in. He certainly had the experience, he certainly had the potential, he certainly had the resolve in January. But when he came back on 6 March, Different, different view of what the Marine Corps is all about, what war is all about, what these people is all about. And I will tell you that having watched that up close and personal early on and thereafter, he kind of used those experiences to make himself a better man, a better Marine, and a better leader, and we're all better for it. We're all better for it. Uh, came back up here, and went back into 231, in and out of 542, continued to do some great flying things. From there, he took a break from the aviation side. He went about an hour and 15 minutes down the road and was a board air controller, the 1st Battalion 8 Marines. It's okay, though. I'll come back to that later, too. Okay? But did a great job there, and I came back up to the wing. And from there, he started the next, like I said, three long, successful tours. During the course of those tours, Squadron Nexo, Squadron 70, Group, Squadron, doing our jobs, doing maintenance. But proving to himself, proving to his Marines, proving to his fellow pilots, he has what it takes and knows what it takes to keep the squadron accomplishing all their missions. In the process of that, it deploys on multiple occasions. Goes out to Guardian Wake, goes out to the Hulk, to Wake uh, Never, does the NEO and uh, MEO and EVAC Ops in Albania, uh, does Operation Southern Watch, uh, takes a break in the middle, goes up to Pax River and is working as a program manager for the NBA thing, does some great stuff up there, learns more about what it takes to get an aircraft online to integrate the technology piece with the training piece with the people selection piece. But he keeps the program alive and well. He moves it from the ABAB to the ABAB 2 Plus. He gets us a lot of the long range, night and uh, precision munition and uh, navigation capabilities that we really need in the airframe and in the Marine Corps. Russell was kind of spearheading that. Okay, comes back down here, goes over for Operation Southern Watch, he thinks, boom, he's in the middle of the uh, OIF. And that is the first of two tours in Iraq and one tour in Afghanistan over the course of the next eight or nine years for Russell. Uh, in between, we get him another break. He gets out of here. He goes up to work on the JSF, the Joint Strike Fighter. He's going to take the great skills he's had for 20 plus years as a Marine. And what he learned about the Harrier, he's going to try to make the JSF the programmer record, the programming future for all his citizens. Can't do that with an average football hitter. You need an on-ball hitter to do that, and that's why Russell's up there doing it. Goes to ICAP, conducted college in the Armed Forces, comes back down here, again, squadron commander, group officer, MAG-14, okay, the largest MAG in the Marine Corps, for those of you sitting here, you know about it. That's what he does. Over 100 aircraft, over 7,000 people, the largest MAG in the Marine Corps. Doesn't go through the shirt wall, 
I can go on and on, but you all get the picture here. There's somebody here who is proficient, somebody who is passionate, somebody who is intelligent, somebody who gives back. And that's what Russell Sanborn does every day, every day. The other thing, for those of you who know Russell is, he's got a great sense of humor. He's pretty quiet and unassuming, most times, okay? Uh, and he's a team ball player. He is a team, he is the consummate team ball player. Now I'm going to flash back to that story at 1-8. There was a CEO at 1-8, and in those days there was no command selection, so he just, when, when the music stopped and the chairs got moved, a couple people were standing and he got in with battalion. Okay? The battalion commander at 1-8 was stepping in, it was just after the Desert Shield Desert Storm, and 20 years ago we were doing just what we're doing today. Right now we're worried what happens at the OIF and OEF, and if we can get a 3-0 army presence spread around the world. After Desert Shore, Desert Storm, we were worried about whether we get a 2-0 presence, and if one all of that presence, then Oregon U could always be on call in the CENTCOM theater operations. Because before Desert Shore, Desert Storm, nobody knew what Iraq was all about until Saddam went across the line there in August. Okay, as we're getting ready to do that 1-0 presence, they get a whole new, new group of battalion commanders, they shorten the life cycle of the battalions down to Camp Majur, and then they FO the four observers, the facts, the food air controls, and the air officers all start showing up. So we don't get a lottery here, we just get three new aviators come in, and we're hoping we get good ones, and we're hoping they're going to stay with the battalion. So in the summer of 1992, three aviators show up to 1A. The battalion commander goes down to the battalion ops though and says, what do we got? He says, sir, I think we're going to do all right. We got a rotary wing and two fixed wings, and one of the fixed wings is a scarier guy, a long dark guy from the aviation unit. I said, okay. I said, before you tell me anything more about them, give me their call sign, which is dangerous business in the ground side. He said, sir, we got Grasshopper, Stinky, and Bart. <laughs> <laughs> I said, first off, I don't want to know about Stinky. I can figure it out more. <laughs> tell me about Grasshopper and Bart. Well, in those days, David Paradigm was doing Kung Fu, and Grasshopper was a great Marine who was from the rotary wing side. He came from mixed uh, descent and lineage but was a sponge, was always trying to learn stuff and was all to dress up in that thing. Then I wanted to know about this part guy. Yeah. Well, Bart Simpson was on TV then, as you know. You know Bart was pretty talented and pretty energetic, but sometimes a little misdirected way. <laughs> so from day one, we all kind of had our eyes on Bart, okay? Now, I will tell you that the guns do have a little sense of humor themselves, and after about two or three weeks, the S3 came up to me and he says, hey, sir, aviators you're asking about they're all volunteers, not voluntolds, and they're all good. We traded up. We got good guys. I said, okay, tell me about this part guy. He said, it's not part guy anymore, sir. It's called Science Expo. He said, Expo? I said, did you show up? He said, no, sir. No, 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 really quiet. But we didn't realize he was an ex-POW, so we're calling him Expo. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know you remember that one, but Greg Sumner and Mike Gregor both said to say hi to my point in all this, ladies and gentlemen, and I won't, I won't take your time, is that whether it's on the air side or the ground side, you have somebody with native talent, somebody with great spirit, and somebody who wants to make the organization better. And it doesn't matter whether it's at the squadron level, the group level, the wing level, or now, soon, the Marine Corps level. And that's what Russell Sanders does. That's what he has done for the last 26 years. He's going to have the opportunity to do that for many, many more years until either Uncle Sam or Linda says that's enough, okay? And we're hoping we can convince Linda to ship over for the long haul again. Linda's been with him since seventh grade. How's that for endurance? <laughs> that's the found rule number one, which is you always marry a loving station. <laughs> that's the key to success around here. Uh, but what I would like to close with is this. Uh, we talk, I talked a little bit about performance and potential. There are 202,000 Marines. They are all great Marines. Every single one of them. Private, gunny, sergeant major, second lieutenant, commandant. They're all great Marines. Within that 202,000, and I'm saying this to the four of you, and especially you before you go to the Naval Academy, all right? There's only 18,000 officers. That's 9%. One out of 10. Officer on this ratio is skewed more, more than any other service. Within those 18,000 officers, there are 650 colonels. That's about 9%. Out of those 650 colonels, every year, when the big music stops and the light shines and the chairs get moved, we'll pick between 8 and 12 brigadier generals. 
that's to do the math, okay? It's 3%, less than 3%. Of that, 9%, okay? By the time you finish, it's about, when you come in as a second lieutenant, your chance of sitting where a Russell Sanborn sits is less than 1,000 of a percent. That's, that's just the way it is. Now, he will never tell you that. The Marine Corps will never advertise that. But that just shows you from second lieutenant to first lieutenant to major to colonel what he has contributed and how he has distinguished himself above and beyond contemporaries. All great Marines, all successful, all team ball players, all doing everything they want to do, everything the Marine Corps asked him to do. But it just shows you he is indeed a cut above. He will never say that. Lena, in the back of her mind, knows that. And that's why she's proud of it. Because the two things he cares about is his family and the Marine Corps. And all he wants to do is take care of both of them, at the end of the day, make them more successful, and give them a better tomorrow. And he has done that both for his family and the Marine Corps for 26 years.